Well, it's good to see you guys here tonight. All of you. And uh, we're on session 27 of how to study the Bible and our second week of the New Testament survey. So last week we came through and we, we learned that the Gospels transitioned us from the Old Testament to the New Testament and that the book of Acts transitions us from God dealing with the Jew to the Gentile and the Gentile church actually. So there's a natural progression that takes place through the Bible. So today, tonight, we're going to start out looking at the Pauline epistles and these are divided into two sections. The letters to the Gentile churches, which is Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians. And then there's the personal letters to uh, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. So that's where we're going to be starting at tonight. So let's have a word of prayer. And we'll go ahead and get started on, on this section of, of our study. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for the folks who are here tonight. Lord, we have so many people that are out sick and uh, hurting and, and just different things going on. And I don't even want to start naming them because I'm sure I would leave somebody out. But Lord, you know all of them. So, Father, we just lift our church body up to you, Lord. Ask that you would be healing bodies and, and Lord, getting people past all these medical issues that we have going on. And, uh, Father, just help us to get back together as a family again. And, uh, Lord, to be able to assemble together and, and just love on one another and show our love to you, Lord. But tonight, Father, for those of us who are here, we just ask that you would meet with us and teach us from your word. And Lord, just help us to see some things that will help us to better understand how the Bible fits together. And we just ask your blessing upon our time in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said, we, we've looked at how the Gospels transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament and the book of Acts. Uh, from the Jew to the Gentile church. So it only stands to reason <clears throat> that if you're going to get doctrine for your church, you should go to the letters for the church or the letters that were written to, written to the church to find it. That's why you must be very careful with how you apply everything that you find in the Bible outside of Paul's letters to the churches. Now, understand that the whole Bible is written for us, but the whole Bible isn't written to us. The letters to the Gentile churches and the personal letters to Christians are written to us. The others are written for us. So we have to be careful how we apply the stuff that we find elsewhere. So my basic tendency is that anything I read in the Bible, if I can't find where Paul talked about it in his epistles and his letters someplace, then I don't believe that it's to me, it's for me. Acts chapter 9 and verse 15 says, But the Lord said unto him, this is the Lord speaking to Ananias, and he said unto him, Go thy way, for he, speaking of Saul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So that was God's words to Ananias concerning Saul, who became Paul, just after his conversion. And he told him he's a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So I want to look at it in another place because the Bible says, 
in the mouth of two or three witnesses is the thing established. So take your Bibles and go over to Galatians chapter 7. I mean chapter 2. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. A little confirmation passage here. We're going to look at verses 7 through 9. Verse 7 says, But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So if you didn't understand what the circumcision and the uncircumcision was, the circumcision is the Jew, the uncircumcision is the Gentile. And Paul saying that same, for he that wrought effectually in Peter, he's talking about the Holy Spirit of God that was working in Peter to the apostleship to the Jews, was working in Paul or Saul to the apostleship to the Gentiles. Verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. The heathen is another term for the Gentiles. So again, just keep in mind that all of the Bible is written for you, but not all of the Bible is written to you. Paul's letters are written to you either as the church or as an individual believer in Jesus Christ. Also keep in mind that the books are not put in your Bible in chronological order. They're in your Bible in a God-ordained order. And you'll really see this as we come through this New Testament survey and do the over, overview of the books. So, the book of Romans is the book of church doctrine. It's the book of church doctrine. Every other book in the list of New Testament books build off of the book of Romans and the doctrines that are mentioned therein. That just may be why God put the book of Romans in the New Testament first. So tonight... We're going to do a quick, simple outline of the book of Romans to set the stage for the rest of the letters that we'll be looking at in the coming weeks. So chapter 1, God shows us that the Gentiles are a mess because of sin. I told you it's going to be simple. Chapter 1, the Gentiles are a mess because of sin. Chapter 2, the Jews are in the same mess for the same reason, sin. So, the first two chapters deal with sin, first with the Gentile, then with the Jew. Chapter 3 explains how following the Old Testament law and or following your conscience will not solve your sin problem. Chapters 4 and 5. These chapters go together to show us God's answer to our sin mess. He explains why being justified by faith 
is the only answer and not all the other stuff that men are trying to do or trying to get you to do. The answer to your sin problem is mine and mine is to be justified by faith. That was chapters 4 and 5. Chapters 6 through 8 deal with the different aspects of a Christian being dead in Christ, not physical death, but spiritual death, which takes place at salvation. So I want to break these chapters down individually, but I just wanted to give you a, a little overview of how that they all work together as well. So chapter 6 covers a Christian's death in relation to sin. A Christian's death in relation to sin. Chapter 7 deals with a Christian's death in relation to the Old Testament law. It shows that there is a purpose for the law to make sin real, but the law cannot remove sin from a person's life. So it has a purpose, and that purpose is to reveal to you and to me our sinful nature. But the law cannot, has never been able to remove sin. It simply manifests sin. It shows you your sin. Chapter 8 shows us the death of a Christian in regard to our future life and the redemption of our body. Romans chapter 8 is probably, at least in my mind, one of the most encouraging chapters in the whole Bible. It tells us about the awesome future that we have coming. It tells us who we are in Christ. It's a great chapter of hope for an awesome future. It's probably, as I said, the greatest chapter on the spiritual body and our spiritual reward as joint heirs with Christ. So let's look at it. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. Verse, let's back up a little bit to verse 14. Verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. To me, you just, you just can't find a passage in the Bible that I can think of that is more exciting to me, that is more uplifting to me than that I'm son of God and I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And I mean, when you stop and you, you put that into perspective, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Everything belongs to Him. And if you're a joint heir, I'm a joint heir. That's pretty good stuff. It means when you look around you, it's all yours. Time's coming. Look at verse 19, still in Romans 8. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of of God the whole earth all of the animals all of the creatures on the earth you know why a dog bites you because of sin it's not the dog's fault it's because of sin in the world you know why a lion can't lay down with a lamb and go to sleep until the lamb's inside him it's because of sin but that's coming to an end that's what what Romans chapter 8 is telling us here That the creature, verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only though, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're saved. The next verse says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Our redemption is nigh. We're going to get our glorified body. And all of this pain, all of this suffering, all of this nonsense that we have to deal with in this life is going to be gone. It's going to be over. And we will have our inheritance as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, if you can't get excited about that, I think you're dead. I just can't... I, I just don't think it can get any better than that. That's why I like Romans chapter 8 so much. I mean, I just think if you can't get excited about that, somebody better check your pulse because you ain't going to be able to do it yourself. So, we need to take a little time here and set up the next section of the book of Romans. Because Paul takes the next three chapters to deal with the Jewish people and the fact that God is not finished with them yet. So, I want to set this up because there is very, very much false teaching on this subject. And we need to know the truth from the Word of God so that we can deal with the false teaching when we're confronted with it. So, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2 and verse <clears throat> verses 8 and 9. Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 and 9.
Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8 says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not but are of the synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So, Jesus Christ was the one doing the speaking there. If you have a red letter Bible, you know that. And he's speaking to two different churches. There's a group of folks claiming that they are now the recipients of God's promise to the Jews. You know for sure God never said that ever because He called it blasphemy. Is that there in, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9? I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. There's a lot of different groups in this world that claim that they have received the promise that God promised to the Jews. Not the doctrines of man. It doesn't change to accommodate anybody. The true church has a doctrine built on a solid rock it has not and it cannot change. Right here, right now, today, we have the same doctrine that the church at Antioch had. Psalm 119, 160. Psalm 119, 160 says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Thy word is true from the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was, was with God, and the word was was God. It hasn't changed for you, for me, or for anybody else. Our doctrine has to be built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ who is the Word of God. It's true from the beginning and it endureth forever. So let's look at chapter 9. And Romans chapter 9 is an explanation of God dealing with Israel. And we see here Paul's heart for his kinsmen. Verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed for Christ, from Christ 
for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. That's Paul's heart. He goes, man, I would give up my position as a Christian in Christ. I'd give it up for my kinsmen, for the nation of Israel, if it'd do any good. But it wouldn't. God's not done with them. But right now, God is dealing with individuals and not with nations. Romans chapter 9 is a tremendous chapter to show us why there's all the conflict that we have in the Middle East. It lays it out for us pretty clearly. Chapter 10. Paul teaches us how that though God started with the Jew first, we are now all one in Christ. Romans chapter 10 is the chapter to go to when leading someone to Christ. It lays out salvation very clearly and it condenses it really to three verses. And I know you've heard these three verses if you've been in this church very much at all. A lot. Verse 9 says that if thou, confess with thy, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a good verse. They're all good. Yeah. In this chapter, Paul contrasts how contrast how God dealt with the nation of Israel in the past and how he was is dealing with Gentiles today. Romans chapter 10 is a tremendous tremendous chapter. We normally stop at verse 13, but let's read on down through there for just a minute. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And how are they going to hear if somebody ain't preaching to them? That's our job, folks. To take the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the world. Romans chapter 11 deals with the restoration of Israel more than any other place in the New Testament. Romans chapter 11, let's look at verses 25 through 27. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, watch this, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. 
So blindness in part tells us that there's some of the Jewish people that still see. And so we need to take every opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. But this blindness in part happens to them until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Until the rapture of the church. That's the fullness of the Gentiles. When that happens, the scales will come off of the eyes of the Jews. Because God is going to be now fully dealing with them. We are in, in this time period in which we live right now, we are in a time of transition where God is moving away from dealing with the Gentile church. We're going to talk about this when we get over here a little further in the, in the book of Hebrews. But now God is, is transitioning back to dealing with the Jew. I'll show you that when we get there. That's why sometimes we look around at what's happening in the world and things are confusing. Things aren't like they was 50 years ago. They're not like they was 20 years ago. They're not like they was five years ago. We're moving in this transitional time. So, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now verse 26. So all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So now we're seeing here verse 26 is not dealing with the individual Jews. It's dealing with all Israel, with the nation of Israel. There's a time coming. And, and I, I don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but it's going to be like, in my mind, seven years and 30 minutes. <laughs> and we're going out of here. The fullness of the Gentiles will be done. There will be a seven-year, almost seven-year period where God is bringing the Jew back in. God, God the Father, is reconciling His wife back to Him. And then at the end of that time period, the Lord Jesus Christ and His bride, that's us, will come back and will establish His kingdom for a thousand years in Jerusalem. All Israel. Look at, look at what verse 26 says. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. He's coming. And we're coming with Him. And the nation of Israel will be reestablished. The kingdom of heaven on earth. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now my friends, if you can read those three verses alone and have it in your mind that God is done dealing with Israel, you need to sit down and pray and ask God to show you how to read and understand the English language. You can't get any more clear than that. In this chapter, Paul lays it out very clearly that God's not done with the, His bride. God is a God of reconciliation. What's our ministry? Our ministry, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that we were given the ministry of reconciliation. Our ministry is to reconcile. We just read it there in Romans that we are the sons of God. We're the children of God. Our ministry is to reconcile people to Jesus Christ. We're given that ministry of reconciliation. We are reconciling people to Christ. When people come to Jesus Christ, they become sons of God. You know what else they become? The bride of Christ. So right now, in our dispensation, in our time period, we are here reconciling the bride of Christ to our husband, Jesus Christ. In that seven year tribulation period, God, using the things that He uses, and it's going to be a rough time, but He's going to use 144,000 Jews, and He's going to use His two witnesses, and He's going to use a beast and another beast and the devil. And He's going to reconcile His bride. And we're coming back with Jesus to establish the kingdom and all Israel will be saved and the kingdom of heaven is going to be right here on earth. That's chapter 11. Chapter 12. In chapter 12, Paul deals with the Christian's relationship with both other Christians and lost people. The key to this chapter is the first three verses. The first three verses of Romans chapter 12 are very popular. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at verse 3. Now we quote the first two verses all the time. But look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What we see is when dealing with all people, understanding, understanding their measure of faith. We all, listen, we all have a different measure of faith. Faith starts out pretty small. But as God does things in our lives, as God brings us through things in our lives, our faith grows. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It also says in, in Hebrews chapter 11 that without faith, we cannot please God. So we start out with a measure of faith. Now, I'm going to get out of my realm here a little bit. But if you cook... You know how the thing works, right? You take a measure of this and a measure of that. And I, when I've read this, I've, I've often thought about my grandmother. Because my grandmother wasn't real good at measuring anything, but she knew how it worked. And the one thing that 
my grandmother always knew was no matter how much sugar you put in it, it needed a little more. That's like faith, man. <laughs> no matter how much faith you have, you can always put in just a little more to make it better. So when we're out there witnessing to people, and when we're in here talking to people, we need to understand that everybody is in a different place in their relationship with God. Some people have been saved for a long, long time. And they've grown. And, they, and they've, they've been fortunate enough to be in a church where they're being taught the Word of God. And some haven't. Some people have maybe just got saved. We're all in different places. Doesn't make any one of us any better than the other one. We're just in a different place. And we need to keep that in mind when we're talking with people, when we're, when we're dealing with people. I don't know if you notice this or not, but none of us are Jesus. None of us have arrived. And we need to keep that in mind. That's why that chapter 12 begins with, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, body, your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, look at this, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know why you got to prove it? Because you don't know it yet. That's why we have to be to put our bodies out here as a living sacrifice, doing the things that God has saved us to do so that we grow. And that's why I put verse 3 in there. Let me go back to verse 2 for just a minute. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That means to prove that in your life. Some of you are pretty good. Some of you are even acceptable. But none of us are perfect. But the will of God is that we be perfect. So if you're good, praise God, keep growing. If you're acceptable, praise God, keep growing. If you're perfect, you're Jesus. That's why verse 3 is there. Not to think of yourself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. According as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. To get there, we must first present ourselves to God holy and acceptable. We get to that place by renewing our mind, which requires prayer, confession of sin, and study of God's Word. When we can live that consistently, then we can live out the other three properly. Chapter 13 deals with the Christian's personal relationship with his government. Verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So if you're wondering if it's okay, if you fudge on your taxes, the answer is no. You'll find the answers to all those types of questions in chapter 13. Romans chapters 14 and 15 covers the relationship between Christians. 
I find it interesting that Paul takes longer to deal with relationships between believers than he does with our relationship with the world. The key to this section of Romans is found in chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. Verse 7 says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. So, since we're all in Christ, you would hope that relationships would come easily and naturally. But they do not. So Paul, in these two chapters, teaches us how to make it work in spite of our flesh. You know that's the problem, right? People get offended because of pride. And it just goes downhill from there. Chapter 16. It's the final chapter of the book of Romans. And it contains Paul's closing remarks. He introduces us in chapter 16. He introduces this to some of his support team and co-workers. Then in the midst of this, he issues an admonition and warning that we must see. And I believe that he put it right here just so it would stand out. So while we're reading through chapter 16, we just all of a sudden go, what? Why is this here? Look at it. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have, heard, which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are, are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Isn't that something? Divisions in the church of God. Verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. That's the church. It's our brothers and sisters in Christ. If they get out of line and they won't get in line, we're to avoid them because they cause divisions in the body. Yes. So, what we have seen here in these 16 chapters, that God has preserved for us every doctrine of the church. All of the letters to the rest of the churches that are following build on these established teachings. Every one of them. 
So Romans, set it up, and the rest of the books just build off of it. Every doctrine to the church is found in the book of Romans. And then it's reiterated through the others, through the other, the other epistles of Paul. So, next time, we'll move on to 1 Corinthians. Just like the book of Romans is 16 chapters of what to do, we're going to find that the book of 1 Corinthians is 16 chapters of what not to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love You and thank You for loving us. Lord, I pray just now that if there's anybody that's heard this message, Lord, it's as we've went through the book of Romans, and they don't know Jesus Christ is their personal Savior, that they would come to know Him right now. Now's the time. As you say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, Behold, now is the day of salvation. So I just pray, if there's anybody here in the building, or anybody that watches the video, we just went through Romans chapter 10, where it tells us very clearly that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We saw in verse 13 where it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I just pray that anybody that listened to this tonight and doesn't know Jesus Christ as their own, that they would come to know Him. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.